Hello and welcome back to English 280 uh, with uh, me, Dr. Matt Barton. In this lecture, we'll be covering the chapter in the book about what is a gay. And as you recall, that is that ontological question, just a fancy word for the study of being. Uh, mainly, what is a game? What does it mean to be a game? At what point does something become a game? Uh, what makes the game one thing and uh, just playing uh, something else, that game and play distinction? Uh, how's a game different from a sport? You know, th there's a lot of questions around this uh, that we can use to uh, fine tune it. Uh, but for our sake today, for our purposes today, we want to just simply discuss and see if we can apply some of these different models uh, for understanding games. We'll look at se several different definitions of them, talk about the pros and cons, and then uh, we'll get into at the end this discussion around genre. So we think about games as being strategy games or action games or role playing games, adventure games, etc. Uh, how much sense does it make to uh, categorize games that way and what are some of the issues around that? So a lot of stuff in this lecture. I'll try to keep it brief, but <laughs> you know, obviously we could spend uh, you know, whole hours and hours just on each one of these uh, questions, but <laughs> we'll do that today. Uh, so the first question is one for you, and the, this is from the book. They ask, are poker and Assassin's Creed examples of the same phenomenon, why or why not? So I think it's a good question. It's a good way to start thinking about this topic. So you can answer that question if you like. Uh, if you haven't played Assassin's Creed, I will just let you pick whatever video game you want there. I mean, I assume that you know what poker is, so <laughs> leave the poker there. Uh, but if you, want, if you want to say compare poker and Pac-Man or poker and Pokemon, uh, that might be fun. That's fine. Uh, just think about two something very different than poker. I uh, don't do like video poker. Or maybe you could. Maybe that'd be interesting. Uh, anyway, I'll just uh, be quiet now. Let you answer the question. <laughs> Come back, and uh, we'll continue on. All right. Uh, so the next question is: Why do we even need a definition of games? Uh, and as we'll see here, there's some ambivalence about this. Not necessarily the case that we have to always have this formal definition. And I think I said last time a lot of this depends on the case. You know, if you're writing an article, you can you can come up with the definition uh, that you're going to use for that paper, the understood definition. So that's kind of what we're building at here, giving you some different philosophers and different theorists, some writers who have proposed different definitions that you could use and build on. Uh, but here's the truth. Most of the time, the general public doesn't really care. Even a lot of hardcore gamers won't care. <laughs> uh, they know what a game is. They don't need to have this... They don't need to go through this formal definition process. Uh, now, however, as a scholar, it is more important. Uh, we do want to achieve a certain clarity as scholars. We don't want to have these wishy-washy uh, categories that don't make any kind of intellectual sense. Uh, we want to try to be solid and coherent. Um, the reason for that, of course, we want to avoid applying inappropriate terminology. Uh, so if we do decide there's these different genres, uh, we don't want them to be blending into each other, so we can't really tell them apart. I mean, imagine something like zoology or botany. They want to be able to classify plants or bugs or whatever the case may be, animals. And it, if we keep running it, if we don't have good terminology, good categories, everything starts to fall apart. Uh, furthermore, if we don't have a good framework in mind, if we don't really know what we mean by game, uh, we can uh, run into some unconscious biases and be privileging a certain type of game over another perhaps or a certain uh, approach to gaming. Uh, so these are all things that we want to be aware of that probably for most of us this is just not, we don't really think too much about when we play a game we don't think too much about what is this thing I'm doing? <laughs> what is this thing you call a game? Uh, you know unless you're from planet Mars or something you probably wouldn't ask that question. Uh, but here we will try to get at some of the definitions people have proposed. Uh, now this is another key factor, the political, the politics of this. So the way we define games may privilege certain fields or departments on a campus, influencing who is authorized or sanctioned to study them, and more importantly, who is eligible for funding. Uh, so yours truly has run into this problem. Uh, I remember long, many years ago, maybe over a decade ago, I was proposing a course like this. I wanted to have a, you know, a, a center. Uh, basically where people could talk about digital media and video games, of course, being a big part of that. 
And this, the question came up of, well, why do, you're an English professor. What do you have to do with gaming? Uh, I think this would be more appropriate for, uh, I think it was an art professor, maybe, and that makes more sense, or computer science. Uh, so that kind of uh, excluded me. I was basically shut up, silenced, whatever you want to call it, othered out of that conversation, uh, which, of course, hurt my feelings uh, quite a bit. Uh, but, it, you know, I'll, just, I'll tell you the story to show you that there's a human side to this question. It's not all just, you know, academics. You know, if we do decide to talk about games in terms of uh, uh, a narrative, games have a narrative, games have a story, uh, games have a, a writing, and there's rhetoric to gaming and all this stuff, then <clears throat> it becomes obvious, well, that's stuff English professors talk about. <laughs> uh, so then it makes sense. If you're just talking about games in terms of graphics, well, then, of course, you know, it makes sense that an art department would be the, the focus there. Uh, or if you're just interested in the coding, the programming, uh, you, you get the idea, right? So it is, there's certain polit uh, politics to this. And then if we go beyond the academy to think about culture, you know, if we're talking about games, uh, somebody in their nuggets had talked about a definition that's not covered in this chapter, but... Uh, some people define games as "quote unquote" murder, <laughs> murder simulators. I think that's a Colonel uh, Grossman, uh, an Army Colonel, that coined that term. So I mean, if you're defining games that way, you know, it sounds like they're horrible things that we should, nobody should be part of. We should just ban all games or keep kids from playing them. So think about how political that kind of definition would be. Uh, versus somebody else who says, well, you know, games are important uh, cultural works. So this is like the next generation of art. And it's like the next generation of film or something. Uh, that's going to get, you know, very different response politically. So I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not a political guy, but, you know, I can appreciate that. Uh, okay, some definitions. So we'll be looking at several popular definitions. And by popular, I don't mean that, you know, you know woohoo, these, <laughs> these definitions are winning a <laughs> contest. Uh, but they, they tend to show up a lot in professional game studies. Maybe even uh, when, you know, a while back when I had you looking at game studies journals, uh, the game studies uh, journal, you might have seen some of these definitions. So it is important to be aware of them, to sort of know the basics. You don't have to memorize them or anything like that. Uh, just be familiar enough with them so that you can recall the name and a little bit about the theory uh, so that when you see it pop up in a game studies article, you're not just flummoxed. Uh, let's see. Uh, so they start off here with Wittgenstein, who they kind of, uh, you know, they don't spend a lot of time on him. I found I found his uh, family resemblances theory useful in my own uh, research. And when I was talking in my book, uh, Dungeons and Desktops, I used uh, Wittgenstein's, this concept, uh, just because, yeah, if you really get down to trying to define exactly what I'm, what do, what do I mean by a computer role-playing game? Uh, you find that just about anything you could say that would seem to make sense, you know, this is what a role-playing game is, and this is what makes it different than uh, an action game or strategy game. You know, whatever it is, you t it tends to get fuzzy, and you start to see, well, an action game also has this. Uh, you know, this, or Skyrim is sort of like a first-person shooter game. Uh, you know, it's all you get into these questions all the time. Uh, so this idea of family resemblances is just like it says. So you have... Uh, Two different members of your family, two brothers, or a brother and a cousin, a brother and an uncle, you know, assuming uh, they're blood relatives. Uh, th there's no, like, perfect representative of that family. <laughs> it's just like, well, that's the Barton nose. and They, they got the Barton, this person has the Barton ears. Uh, this person has the Barton hair. Uh, that person's a Barton, but they don't have the Barton uh, chin. <laughs> you know? I mean, you get the idea, right? It's like some combination uh, of some of these. In some sense, this family resembles something. It's not really clear. Uh, they don't all resemble one person, uh, right? But, you know, b b amongst the group, there's all these resemblances. And you, you can sort of tell, like, well, you, I can see you're part of this family. I see a resemblance. Uh, so that's uh, Wittgenstein's talking more than just about games here, uh, but that's basically the theory. Uh, that everything, more, you know, things are more like this idea of a family resemblance than something we can point to and say, that is the thing. Uh, that is the Barton. <laughs> Being a little silly here, but hopefully, hopefully you're getting the idea. Uh, so some problems with this, 
Uh, one, he doesn't really try too hard to find a common feature or prove that there isn't one. He's just kind of using games here as a brief example. Uh, just something, a little subject he doesn't spend a lot of time on. He doesn't focus zero in. Uh, maybe if he had a thought more about it, he could have come up with a common feature. So there's that. <clears throat> and then another problem is that some languages, uh, I think English and German, or in the, which I think oh, Wittgenstein, I'm pretty sure, was writing in German. Uh, they just have this one word for like all types of games, like we do. But uh, the book points out that I think Danish and a couple other languages, there are different words. There's a word that means like a serious game uh, versus just a sort of make believe activity or something less organized. Uh, so they have built into the language these different categories. So basically what they're saying there is this might just be something peculiar to the Germanic language or to a German, <laughs> German, <laughs> one of those days, or English. And maybe if we were from a different language, uh, this wouldn't be even be an issue. It wouldn't make sense to say what Wittgenstein is saying. Uh, so there's that. Uh, now moving into, and let me just make sure I got the pronunciation of this guy's name right. Sorry, I meant to do this before the lecture, but we'll just clear it Pronounce up. Pronouncenames.com. <laughs> Let's see. Heisinger. Heisinger. Okay. Maybe it's useful that I showed you that. So if you're ever not sure about how to pronounce a name, just go to uh, type it into Google Pronounce, and then put the name there, and you'll get it. Heisinger. And the Magic Circle. So there's this book comes up all the time for pretty obvious reasons if you think about it. Uh, so he, the book is called Homo Ludens. And if you know about Homo, uh, this could be Homo sapiens, right? Or Homo, uh, there's one that means the tool using animal. Homo, I'm blanking on the name of that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's sort of a way to think about a species. Like, who are we? What makes us different than other animals? And uh, Heisinger says it's because we play games, right? We are the game playing animal. Say, well, I see squirrels playing games, but is it really a game? I mean, is it, they're just, they're, they're playing, sure, but they don't have this concept of, <laughs> you know, you don't see a little squirrel referee uh, out there with some flags. You know, if you, if you see that, you might want to, you know, put down the, <laughs> put down the bond. Uh, so anyway, if we think about this, you know, if we're defining, this is who we are as a species, we're the, the game playing animal, well, that kind of elevates gaming uh, this becomes a very critical part of what it means to be a human. Uh, so it's a very important study, very important that we know about games. Uh, so we have the part of this concept, or if you read the book, he gets into this concept of the magic circle. And the idea there is when you're playing a game or playing in make-believe or whatever, you're separating the real world from this world of the game. Uh, so we, we kind of talked about this. And some people claim that kids can't do this that they're not aware that they're playing a game. I think that's kind of maybe very, very small children, but I think we quickly come to uh, <laughs> to learn, like, this is a game, uh, this is the real world. Uh, but when you are playing that game, it is kind of a special zone. You know, you don't bring uh, all your outside problems into the game, or at least you shouldn't. And that, I think this is true for pretty much anything, sports included, right? Uh, the world of the basketball court uh, is not the same as the world beyond the court. But you have the game, that takes place within the magic circle, but then when we step out, we can step outside that circle back into the rural world. Now, I see this talked about too in terms of immersion. Uh, I thought this was funny. I came up with this. So you might have heard the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And so I, <laughs> I just added New Vegas. So what happens in New Vegas stays in New Vegas, right? We, we enter this, this world's kind of set apart, player game. And then when we're done, we step back out of that into the real world. But there's some value in having this sort of place that we go to uh, to play our games in. Uh, so again, the value here, the emphasis is on we need to value games. It's an important part of humanity. It's not just fun. It's not just frivolous. Now, some problems with this definition or understanding is that it's not mutually exclusive. Uh, the authors talk about how, well, you know, you could say the same about a university class. It's kind of a special context. It's kind of a magic circle as well. <laughs> you know, we talk about the ivory tower. Uh, a lot of times you'll do things in a class, simulate things. Uh, there's no real consequences to it. 
you know, maybe make a bad grade in a class, but it's not the same as, you know, actually being out, you know, think about like a nursing class or uh, some class related to medicine, medical school, right? These are special contexts with particular rules, but there, nobody would talk about that as being a game. And so that's the problem. It's not mutually exclusive to games. And two, there are real world consequences even no matter how you try to apply this concept of the magic circle and say gaming is like this very special activity that doesn't apply to anything else well it takes up time you know it's you play a game for an hour that's an hour you could have been doing something else so there's that uh does i think everybody would agree affect your mood your behavior uh, at least your mood you know you play a game sometimes you feel better after the game sometimes worse uh, sometimes a game can inspire you to go do things uh, certainly important way to communicate ideas even if it's not an educational game per se uh, i feel like i've learned a lot by playing uh, the civilization series uh, that they talk about in this book you know there's a lot of history you can learn in that so it's kind of a communication idea that affects me outside the game not just while i'm playing civ uh, that information is useful outside the game and uh, finally they, there is real world consequences such as selling an in-game item for real money uh, people used to freak out about this. Like, it's a big deal. Oh, somebody just spent $100 of real money to buy a hat for their character in this MMO. Well, isn't that a crazy person? It's not really crazy. Uh, you know, it's just not... A lot of people value their avatars and the people, their friends that they meet in these games aren't just, like, they're not fake friends, uh, virtual friends. I mean, those are their friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's not like there's a special place where you, the MMO, and then, not, and then that's totally separate from the rest of your life. Uh, that's just not the case uh, for many people. Uh, not even getting into like Facebook games, like we talked about Farmville. Uh, you're sort of playing those. But, but anyway, moving on. Uh, so now we have Kiowa, Roger Kiowa. I looked the pronunciation up on that. Uh, so his contribution is to talk about these four qualities of play so we have the agon the competition i think most games are, there's a there's a competitive aspect think about chess tennis whatever uh alia uh, which is chance so most games again there's some chance factor you know one of the things that they uh the game mario kart if you remember that one of the reasons that's claimed anyway that that game is so popular is that it doesn't really matter how great you are at racing. You know, you can be very skillful, but it's got these little power-ups that come out every now and then, and just kind of, if you're lucky, you can grab one of those power-ups and zoom ahead, or like, uh, so knock the person that's in the lead back to the uh, back of the row. And so there's that chance factor. Uh, so those people say so that's a very important part of Mario Kart, that, there's, that that's built in, because uh, it lets, you know, your little kid brother beat you sometimes, right? Uh, the mimicry is another quality of play that uh, uh, K.O.Y. talks about, imitation. So you think about a uh, role-playing where you're pretending to be somebody else, you're kind of imitating a warrior. Or a simulation game, you're sort of imitating fishing, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then this last one, really weird-looking word, elinx, elix, elix, probably should have looked up the pronunciation on that. But that means vertigo. So think about a roller coaster, I suppose, or some of, the, uh, some of these... Uh, virtual reality games you sort of you sort of like this it's not, i kind of think about why people get drunk <laughs> you know you kind of like this feeling of oh kind of you know i'm not moving quite right uh, it's sort of a, almost an out of body like experience that some people really enjoy and there are games that accommodate that so we can look here at some of these examples on this gaming concepts graphic so competition Boxing, I guess, is a pretty good example. So a lot of sports fit in the agon. Uh, then over here with the luck, we have things like a lottery or rolling some dice. Mimicry, they put RPGs, theater, uh, a make-believe game. And then this last category, so look, at, <laughs> they misspelled. Either I've misspelled it or they misspelled it. Who knows? Uh, it links. Uh, they put things like uh, extreme sports, walking a tightrope, <laughs> I suppose. All right, and here we have his uh, continuum, uh, Kiowa, of uh, Padea, or Paidea, 
on the left and Ludus on the right. Uh, so the idea is some games there's a lot more playfulness, there's not really a solid goal in mind, and not a lot of emphasis on following a rule. It's not so formal. Uh, the, on the Ludus side, though, you do get more and more rule-based, and like the rules are very, very important to that game. So they have The Sims over here on the left, which if you played that game, you know, you can do a lot of different things. There's not really, like, you win The Sims. You know, some people like torturing their Sims. Uh, some people <laughs> uh, some people like making their Sims do really well. It's just kind of up to you. Uh, all the way over to uh, Sudu Sudoku. I always have a hard time with this word. But, you know, there is definitely a right and wrong way to play that. And people that enjoy the game, they enjoy it primarily because of those rules. It wouldn't be much fun if I just said, well, I'll just put whatever numbers you want. And that'll be a game. No, that's that would that'd be stupid. <laughs> you know, there's a way you play Sudu Sudoku. And same thing with Dance Dance Revolution. you you got to put your feet in the steps or on those arrows or whatever. And if you just said, well, just do whatever you like, it wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be the game anymore. It'd be, you'd just be uh, playing very, very badly. All right, so here's the second question for you. So think about your favorite game, and then uh, is it more focused on that agon? Is it more competitive? Is it more about chance, Aaliyah? Is it more about imitation, mimicry? Or is it more about inducing vertigo? or Elinx. Uh, so why do you think you're drawn to that type of game? All right, so some problems with uh, this. Uh, well, Jesper Jewell, name comes up a lot in this book. He says that these distinctions aren't always all that useful. Again, sometimes a game might seem to fit multiple categories. Uh, a lot of the even thinking about rules in terms of limitations doesn't always make sense. Uh, usually you can do a lot more than what the games themselves explicitly specify. And you know we'll get into this too but a lot of times you build a game and players can find new ways to uh, basically players can do things that the designers never intended. Things the rules don't explicitly specify. Seemed like there was a game uh, I think it was maybe Morrowind and the players found out a way to like enter this secret zone and it was really just a bug in the code to let them do this but they kind of some people made that part of the game they said they rationalized it as well this is kind of magic <laughs> I'm kind of plane stepping or whatever uh, so there's things of that sort uh, second games like FIFA Minecraft, uh, they seem to belong in multiple categories. So again, this idea of these categories aren't mutually exclusive. You put more than one thing in the category, and some things seem to fit multiple categories. Uh, and third is that, can you really have a game without any rules? You know, is anything ever totally all rules or totally all uh, Pydia? And so they're talking about, well, even like a little kid, tiny kid, uh, they're playing uh, make-believe, tea or whatever you want to have their teddy bear picnic <laughs> if you really sit down with a kid they will have rules to go with this and you can't just uh, uh, give the teddy bear anything to drink or eat right it's, well no you can't do that this you have to give the blue cup to the teddy bear and the uh, the piglet gets the red bull uh, i don't know just making stuff up but they, ha they will have rules um then marshall McLuhan's next and i really like McLuhan. he's He's kind of known for just saying these things. He's kind of like Nietzsche in some ways, I guess, with these, he'll say these things that sound really profound, and they a lot of times are, uh, but then he just kind of stops there. He says something, you're like, ooh, that's really, you know, that's really something. It sounds like something Yoda would say, maybe. Uh, but then there's no follow-up. You know, then he just moves on to something else. Uh, so a lot of times you'll find really brilliant kernels of things you can take, pick up, run with. Uh, <clears throat> so he's great for that. And his things, thoughts about games fall into that category. So he's saying games are reflections of culture, and thus the most popular games in a culture reveal its core values. Now, they're also important ways to relieve tension. So we've talked about this concept before. You know, why is soccer so popular in some countries, not popular in other countries? Maybe it has something to do with the economy or the form of government. Uh, who, who knows? Something to do with that culture. And I've seen this applied to films as well. Just recently completed a series, and they were looking at the swords and sandals movies over the years. If you and uh, 
or science fiction films. Uh, so they were, let's see, what was it? Um, the Running Man. Remember that movie the, with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger? Uh, so they were saying that movie was sort of appropriate for the 80s and the 80s values, but then uh, the modern version of it, which is uh, Ready Player One, uh, it's sort of the similar concept, but now it's been changed to reflect our culture today uh, more so than that uh, was appropriate in the 80s. Uh, so you still see this argument made all the time. Uh, the problems are that it's never really explained like how this works. It's hard to prove, you know, maybe it's just chance again. <clears throat> maybe just people like the running man but might have had nothing to do with the stuff going on outside of uh, that theater. Maybe people just really thought that Jesse Ventura and Schwarzenegger were fun to watch. <laughs> uh, they had nothing to do with the cultural climate. Uh, so that's one of the problems. And also, if you think about soccer again, soccer is basically popular everywhere but here. <laughs> you know, there might be a couple countries where they don't play soccer, or at least it doesn't get the emphasis. It's not like the number one sport. Uh, but the, the point is that you see it in very different cultures i mean you watch these soccer like the um the world cup and these cultures these these teams might be from very different places very different everything you know, everything the religious language uh, anything you want to say about their cultures will be different yet they both really love soccer uh, so how is that you know if this is true then this wouldn't make sense and then this, this thing about the tension a lot of games aren't about relieving tension at all in fact they are designed to, to make you tense. <laughs> Think about the whole uh, horror genre of games. I mean, that's far from uh, relaxing. Okay, now we have Brian Sutton Smith, and he challenges this idea that we of homo ludens. He says, well, games really don't exist in all cultures. In fact, uh, cult games are something that happen after a culture, or they sort of evolve along with the culture. So as a culture becomes more sophisticated, as it becomes more educated, enlightened, whatever, uh, their games will evolve. So you might start off with very simple games of like, let me hit you with a club, <laughs> bam, okay. Now you hit me with a club, bam, you know, isn't that fun? And somehow that becomes baseball as we get to be smarter. <laughs> okay. Uh, and he's got a definition of games as, quote, an exercise of voluntary control systems in which there is an opposition between forces confined by a procedure and rules in order to produce a disequilibrial outcome. Uh, so there's you know, a definition you can use. Uh, there's certainly problems with it in this uh, line of thinking. Some of the ones the book points out is one that all games are not finite, fixed, or goal-oriented. You know, this definition doesn't make sense for all games, right? It's, I'm trying to think of some examples. There's an opposition between forces. You know, I suppose even something like The Sims, you could say there are things opposing whatever your your goal is that you come up with. So this definition seems fairly good to me. You know, maybe some of the broader uh, context that they point out here. They're certainly true that not all games are uh, uh, finite. World of Warcraft, for example, just goes on and on and on. <laughs> so they keep making the money. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, George Herbert Mead, uh, he talks about play and make-believe basically from a psychological perspective, right? This is like part of the human development process, part of the process by which we become functional adults in society. So children that are playing around, make-believe, playing games, they're not just having fun. Uh, they're basically becoming adults. They're using these games to learn how to be uh, adults. So they're taking the attitude of everyone else involved in a game and that these different roles must have a definite relationship to each other. We integrate into a society. So if you think about your little league uh, back in grade school or whatever, uh, or the little games you're playing with your friends, maybe that had a bigger role in your development, cognitively speaking, uh, than you might imagine. This could be an important way we integrate into a society. Uh, role playing lets us learn different roles and rules. You know, this, this mean has definitely been influential in terms of learning games and using games for education. There's a lot of emphasis, a lot of uh, <clears throat> pretty good theory out there that says if you let kids play a role, 
Uh, a lot of times I will inspire them, make them more confident. You know, if I say, for this ex exercise, I'll let you be the teacher. And it's like a little fun game. You know, the kid gets to be a teacher for a while. Uh, but there's, there's some evidence that maybe that's more than just frivolous. Like maybe this being playing that role helps the kid develop. And so it's pretty fascinating stuff. All right, moving on to uh, Henry Jenkins. He's a name that comes up a lot. Uh, if you like fan fiction as well, he comes up a lot. He's got this book called Convergence Culture. And it's a very influential. talks about transmedia, uh, meaning that uh, games are just like if a new franchise comes out, Star Wars. Well, that's an old franchise. But, <laughs> but if you think about Star Wars, it's more than just the movies. It, movies are certainly an important part of that, but you got books, comics, games, you know, this whole smorgasbord of stuff, and different aspects of that story are told in those different formats. That's transmedia. It's not just one form of, it's not just one medium uh, that's Star Wars. Star Wars is a lot of different uh, forms. Uh, so he defines video games here as a new form of popular art, and he relies on this. Uh, I guess art historian named Seldes, who talks about lively arts. I think Seldes is talking about films. Uh, so things that move you emotionally rather than intellectually. I'm not quite sure where they're going with that, but I think the key is that games are kind of this form of art. There's a lot of artistic possibilities there. Uh, the best games let players have a spectacular influence on the game and its outcome. Choices matter. Uh, so we'll come back to this concept a lot, but it's kind of a big deal. If you watch Hamlet, the play, or you watch a movie, you can't really affect like what happens. It's just whatever the writer, uh, producers have decided is going to happens happens. Doesn't really matter. You can yell at the screen. You know, if you're watching a uh, soccer, you can you know, scream and yell and shout. Doesn't make a darn bit of difference. <laughs> uh, whereas with a game, if you're playing that FIFA game, yeah, your choices will have this influence. Your will matter. It'll have an effect on the outcome. And that's something cool uh, from an artistic perspective. Uh, so Jenkins says, games shouldn't just be imitating film. You know, that's a lot of uh, game directors. I think they secretly want to be film directors. They want that clout. So they make them very much like films. Uh, so Jenkins says that's that's wrong. Uh, you should really be zeroing in on this idea of the choices mattering, of I think, you know, expressive amplification. Uh, that should be the focus making those uh, choices really interesting and pivotal, that's more important than just making uh, more lens flare effects or whatever they're doing, silly stuff to try to make a game look like a film. Uh, and then another famous definition or somewhat of a definition comes from Chris Crawford, who, unlike these other folks, he actually is a professional game designer. So he's from the industry, but also a scholar. You know, we mentioned this. That happens in game studies. It's not all just professors. Uh, a lot of these folks are professional game designers or gamers even, and they're there contributing their insights. So Crawford gives us these four things to think about with games. He talks about representation. You know, games represent something else. Uh, they're not part of, uh, or it's a subset. They represent a subset of reality. They're not reality. <laughs> you might, uh, I remember this came up in the a discussion I had with, I forget who I was talking to, but we were talking about the game uh, Pirates, Sid Meier's Pirates. I think it might have come up in uh, discussions of Star Wars games, too. But, you know, there's certain things that are easy to represent in a game uh, from a movie. Like with the Star Wars, obviously, you have these lightsaber duels. Uh, with the Pirates, you have uh, certain aspects of being a pirate that make for a fun game. You know, again, with the sword play. Uh, again, with the, uh, you know, sailing around in these big ships and firing cannons and things. Uh, you don't necessarily want to model all aspects, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, there's not many games where you're modeling like going to the bathroom. You know, we, we can leave some things out. Uh, so it's, the idea is subjectively representing some subset. Things about the uh, things that you think would be fun for a game, not necessarily everything to do with that activity you're simulating. Uh, interaction, you know, that kind of goes without saying. Again, if you can't interact with it, is it even a game? I think I think that's probably the one thing we can agree on. <laughs> you know, if you're just looking at it and you can't make any input, eh, that's not even a game. You have to be able to interact somehow. 
Uh, this one's a little more controversial. Conflict. So it's something there that's trying to stop you. Uh, some way to die if it's an action game or at least uh, some way you have to get the, to get the door open and to get to the next area. I think a Metroid series is great about this idea. Right? You have to do certain things, gain certain powers to be able to, or Zelda, uh, to be able to go into this area. Uh, so that could be the conflict. It doesn't necessarily have to be an enemy, something trying to be, it doesn't have to be something violent. Uh, just something there to uh, inhibit you that you have to overcome. That's the conflict. And then the safety is another area where game develop or game studies kind of splits. Like, well, this is kind of back to that magic circle idea, right? This idea that the failure, you can fail in a game and it's fine. doesn't affect you in real life. It's just a game. Uh, so it's one thing to die playing Metroid, another thing to die in the, in the real world. Uh, of course. Uh, so that makes sense. But again, you know, you don't have to think very hard to know people that this is just not true if somebody dies in a uh, world of work well maybe not world of warcraft it is so easy just to come back but <laughs> you know in a sense you know if you're really just failing at world of warcraft uh, you can't get past the raid boss or whatever or you keep getting kicked out of groups uh you know that could lead to very real life very tragic consequences for people it's not always just you know fun and games for lack of a, a better way to put this uh, people feel bad if their pets die, you know, if they're playing one of these pets uh, simulator games. Uh, so there's a lot more going on. And, you know, I talk to people that I still don't quite know what to make of this, but they talk about being in love or having a relationship with the characters in their games. And they talk about, that's my that's my girlfriend. You know, it's a virtual character. Uh, <laughs> you know, okay, Uh for me, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but for them, that is a real relationship. It's not just a fantasy. It's not just make-believe. Uh, again, I don't quite know what to make of that myself. Uh, other definitions, we got Salen and Zimmerman here. Uh, they define games as this way. A game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules, results in a quantifiable outcome. So some interesting pieces to this definition. Again, we have this idea about a conflict, some kind of some kind of competition, uh, either with uh, another player, with an enemy, with maybe the comp conflict is just a time limit uh, or whatever. Uh, some kind of rules governing this behavior. You can't just do anything you want. Uh, and then there's going to be a quantifiable outcome. So I guess this is they put it this way. So it's more than just winning and losing. You know, maybe there's. You still win, but you didn't win as fast or as quickly as somebody else won. <laughs> you know, who knows? Uh, Jesper Jewell here has a very lengthy definition. And since he is such a key figure in game studies, maybe we should consider his definition. Uh, so he defines it as, defines games as a, quote, rule-based formal system with a variable and quantifiable outcome where different outcomes are assigned different values, the player exerts effort in order to influence the outcome, the player feels attached to the outcome, and the consequences of the activity are optional and negotiable. So you can really tell this is a definition that has just been worked to death. You know, I can imagine people, this jewel, people trying to nitpick his earlier definition, so he's like trying to cover all the bases here, like all the possible objections, so I think we arrive at something that sounds sounds okay. Uh, you know, how useful is this? It's very lengthy, very long. <laughs> uh, so you get into that. You know, the utility of this definition. Does it really help us or does it just try to, you know, cover all possible objections? Might be academically correct, if you will, but not necessarily useful. Uh, this might make a little more sense if you look at the model as a diagram. So you can see, you think about these, uh, uh, what are these called, these circles, a Venn diagram, I think. So instead of, you can think about what where a game would be, what circle does it occupy? And we sort of have the pure games with fixed rules, negotiable consequences, player attachment to outcome, effort. So whether we're talking about chess or Pac-Man there, uh, down to like a game of pure chance. So something like video or a slot machine, 
you know, there's not, you just put the money in and pull the handle, right? There's not a lot of uh, strategy that's possible there. Now, some people might think they have a good method, but there's a lot more chance, not a whole lot of effort. Uh, so that's kind of the borderline cases, all the way out to like something that's not really a game at this point. So they talk about storytelling. And you know, one of the examples that comes up a lot in my work is the idea of a walking simulator. So that's a very dismissive term. So somebody will say, this is a walking simulator. And what they mean by that is really just a story. You're walking around, you're seeing things, you're listening to dialogue, but there's you don't really have anything you can do other than just walk around. You can't affect the outcome. Uh, there's You can't shoot anything. <laughs> or pick, You know, you can be very restricted in terms of what you can do. So they say that's a walking simulator. That's not a game. Uh, so it's certain cases like that, I think you could you could pull up this model and say, well, okay, let's see, where does it fit? Uh, there's no, there's you can't, you always get the same ending no matter what. So you say, oh, it's a fixed outcome. Uh, you don't really have to, you could just sit there. The game would basically play itself. So there's no player effort. You don't really care about what you're doing. So I think in those senses, that's a, I like the uh, the model. I like this this uh, Venn diagram better than the <laughs> that definition. Uh, so anyway, we've talked about a lot of these at this point. So I'll just stop for a moment, uh, review, look through your book, probably easier, and just pick one of these that you like and tell me what, what do you find appealing about it and then maybe why uh, you think that's appealing. All right, so moving on, try to uh, <laughs> wrap this up here. Uh, so now we move into pragmatic definitions. So these are, again, it's not necessarily academically sound, uh, philosophically correct, uh, lo logically sound, <laughs> uh, but it's useful, and it gets us thinking about games in a way that might help lead to better games. So Sid Meier has this famous definition of a game as a series of interesting decisions. So if you played Civ, you know this is exactly what Civ is. You're always like, should I build this here? Should I build that there? What do I do on this turn? Do I move these units over here? Do I attack this person? Do I make a treaty? You know, you're always asking yourself all these questions. Uh, and it's really interesting to see how it plays out. So you play Civ one time, you're like, well, I'm just going to go to war with everybody, see how that works. Next time you play it, you might say, I want to go for that uh, civics victory or the uh, there's different kinds of victories, different ways to win, basically. And it's interesting, right? They make the game develop. The reason Civ is so popular and people play it again, again, again. I mean, I've played this game, I don't even, probably thousands and thousands of hours <laughs> playing various Civs <laughs> because it's interesting. You know, you don't really know. You're, you're always trying out something different. Uh, there's so many different things you can try. Uh, and it's you're always curious, like what's going to happen next? You know, so I got to play one more turn because I really want to see what, what my sieve is going to be like now that I got this new unit, or now that I've got this uh, new resource. Finally, got this resource. Uh, so I think this is a great way to think about games. When you're designing a game, you know, you you want to be asking yourself, am I putting the player in that role? You know, am I giving them interesting choices to make so that they'll want to come back and play again and again, see how all those different options play out. And then uh, Hunicke, Hunick uh, et al., uh, they have their MDA model. Again, something that gets brought up a lot is being useful, even if it's not necessarily technically sound. Uh, so they split games up into the MDA, uh, M being mechanics. So rules, basic code, not stuff that you actually see as you're playing the game. Uh, the sort of underlying stuff. And that's a little bit of a different way to think about mechanics that you'll see el elsewhere, but that's their understanding. Uh, then they talk about dynamics. So dynamic means it changes, right? These are things that change. You know, you play the same game two or three times, and different, but different, you'll get different results, right? Things are playing out, different events can occur during that game. So we could play Civ over and over and over. It's always going to be a little different because of the, these dynamics. Uh, even though it's the same rules, you know, it's the same code. The code's not changing. The rules aren't changing. That's the mechanics, but the dynamics do change every time. Uh, and then aesthetics, this is sort of where it gets wonky, in my opinion. It's like everything else is, <laughs> fits into this sort of huge category. Uh, so here we get sensations, fantasy, narrative. They stick the narrative in there with all this other stuff. 
challenge, fellowship, discovery, expression, submission. So in my opinion, there's just too much stuff. I think they need more categories than just putting all this other stuff into one called aesthetics. Uh, but I guess it works uh, for some people. Uh, now, well, let's wrap up with this idea of the issues of genre. Uh, so we talked about how games, you go to the GameStop, you go to uh, your Xbox GameStop or Game Store, or whatever they call that, Microsoft Store, I think. Or is it Gold? Anyway, uh, they'll have games, usually, or Steam. Uh, they'll have games broken up into these categories. So they might say, this is an action game, this is an adventure game. And you can look at like the top adventure games, the top role-playing games. Uh, my problem is... Especially on Steam, I'll like look the top 10 role playing games, and they'll put there's almost always a game in there that I'm like, that's not a role playing game, you know, maybe they've got a Doom uh, in there, or a, a like a Deus Ex, or uh, you know, or Assassin's Creed, even. And I'm like, Assassin's Creed to me is not a role playing game, uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about it. You know, that I guess you could make a case somehow that this should be a role playing game, but you know, to me, it would definitely be more of an action game. Uh, but same thing with adventure categories to me, an adventure game is a very specific thing. I have a understanding of what that means. I would say Life is Strange that's an adventure game. Uh, but anyway, um, as you can see, there's a lot of disagreement about what the games are, how to categorize them. A lot of times it's just a matter of convenience more than anything else. Uh, <clears throat> and Steam will actually let you tag a game. I don't think they actually factored that in. So if everybody's saying that it's a role-playing game, maybe they'll put it in there. Uh, there's no objective way to measure the differences between two things. That's one of the things the authors claim. There's no objective way of determining which similarities or differences are the most important. Uh, genres are arbitrary. So I've seen a lot of game studies about this. Uh, for example, a game like, uh, oh, let me think of a science fiction one. So we have like Mass Effect series is science fiction, and uh, Halo is science fiction. And so you say, well, those are just science fiction games. That's their genre. <laughs> but yeah, okay, they're both got like space. <laughs> <laughs> space travel and aliens but you know is that is really the most important similarity or you know i think it's a lot more important that the you know mass effect is it's very different uh yes there's some overlap with halo but to me the differences are more important uh, than just those the fact that they're both set in space you know the fact that with the mass effect you have the levels you have uh different characters that you can outfit with weapons I mean, it just goes on and on uh, so I would not put those two games in the same genre, uh, whereas other people would say, be fine with that. Uh, so it kind of just depends on your mood, I guess, your purpose at the time. Uh, and these authors, I don't like their, you know, categories very much, but, you know, I can, I can roll with it, as it were. Uh, so they just give us these four. So they talk about action games being something where it's more about physical uh, physicality, I would call it, you know, how good are you with a controller? How quick are you with a joystick? Uh, so Pac-Man, Red Dead Redemption fits into those. You know, kind of adrenaline rush games. Uh, then they talk about adventure games. And they put uh, Longest Journey in there, which I would agree with. Uh, but then they put lump in like role-playing games. <laughs> you know, I would never do that. But, uh, okay, they, they, they're they going to do that. <laughs> uh, I didn't write the book. Uh, so I guess that with the emphasis there being more on a story, being more on a narrative and characters and so on. And then they have a strategy games category, you know, where to me, I'm like, if you're going to separate strategy, you should separate role playing. But, but anyway, uh, so they put Civ in there, you know, games where it's more, more st strategy. Basically, you're thinking about moves or you're thinking about units, Starcraft, uh, the old Warcraft series. Um. Kind of like if you go back to board games, games like Risk or um, uh, what's the other one that always gets Access and Allies, you know, so those sorts of games. Um, and then they have process oriented games where it's kind of again one of these, let's just throw everything else in this category. <laughs> you have Sim City in there and then World of Warcraft. 
Uh, I guess because you don't really win World of Warcraft per se, you know, it kind of goes on and on. It's more about the process of uh, leveling and gearing up your characters. You know, okay. You know, even with that, I'm thinking though, within World of Warcraft, you do have those uh, raids. You know, you do either beat, you either complete the raid or you don't. You go into the arena, you go into PvP, you, you win or you don't. <laughs> so, so you see, you know, we're never going to agree with, about everything. All right, anyway, thanks for watching this. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like you to uh, ask a question or make a comment about the material. And uh, after that, have a great day.